Welcome to this episode of the NBC OT exam prep course from the OT Dude Academy. If you haven't already, you can enroll in the comprehensive online course for free, which includes a quiz based on this video. The link is in the description. This video will focus on OA, but some principles such as OT evaluation and intervention will also be very similar and also apply to RA, rheumatoid arthritis. I'm Jeff, the OT Dude, and Let's get functional. There are two types of arthritis to know for the NBCOT exam, osteoarthritis and rheumatoid. Osteoarthritis OA is the most common form of arthritis and also in general, a common diagnosis that you will encounter in OT practice if you work in physical disabilities. It is one of the leading causes of lower extremity disability among older adults especially in joints such as the knee and hip. There are also many potential risk factors for increased susceptibility to OA based on the individual and specifically at the joint. For the individual, factors include age, sex, obesity, genetics, ethnicity, diet, and bone metabolism. More specifically, older adults being female, more obese with increased BMI are these risk factors. Also, risk factors that make the joint more susceptible include injury, activity, occupation, leg length discrepancy, the joint itself, strength, and alignment. Pathophysiologically, OA occurs when the cartilage inside the bone that cushions the bones deteriorates or even wears down completely and there is bone rubbing on bone. This progressive disease may cause pain, physical disability, and psychological distress. I mentioned the lower extremities being common for OA, but it is also prevalent in the hands and affects the DIP, PIP, and CMC joints of the hands. And thinking critically because of this, this can result in associated functional impairment due to substantial pain, joint instability, deformity, and loss of motion. For the hand, two terms to know are Heberden's and Bouchard's nodes. Bouchard's nodes are the small bony growths or lumps at the PIP, and Heberden's nodes are the same but at the DIP. To remember this, the word bouche actually means mouth, and between the mouth and the tongue, you can stick out your tongue, so the mouth is more proximal, as in proximal of the PIP joint in Bouchard's nodes. So Bouchard, Bouch, mouth, proximal to tongue, and therefore the tongue being more distal for the DIP deformities of Heberdet's nodes. The classification of OA is primary OA and secondary OA. Primary is related to bone involvement and secondary is related to other factors such as genetics, trauma, and infections. Another is the staging of OA. Here's an illustration of the stages of knee arthritis. While there is no cure for OA, management includes medications, surgical interventions, such as total hip and total knee replacements, and OT. Osteoarthritis typically presents with joint pain, but it is more common when done with activity. More advanced OA pain is often deep and may not even be localized. There also may be short periods of stiffness, sometimes called gelling. The joint instability can be dangerous as it can cause, say, the knees to buckle and give way to, say, falls. And sometimes the joints may swell and therefore have deformities and reduced movement. Crepitus is the sound made from the rubbing of bone on bone. A secondary symptom is psychosocial distress related to pain, loss of function, and due to other of the primary symptoms. So based on these symptoms, they are actually some of the things that you would look for in evaluation as well. For example, during your evaluation, you should look, palpate, or feel for, and listen, also take for tenderness, crepitus, bony enlargements, reduced range of motion, pain on ranging, deformities at the joints such as Bouchard's and Heberden's, joint instability, altered gait, 
muscle atrophy, and joint effusion, which means a swollen joint. An example of an outcome measure that you can use, it should be ideally standardized, is the Jepson Taylor hand function test. But you can also use observation, such as during the patient doing activities such as writing, fastening their buttons while dressing, while opening a medicine bottle, for example. So occupations to assess, of course, include things like ADLs and IDLs, but also other ones such as rest and sleep, work, leisure, socialization, and with the OTP, F4's new terminology, health management related to the condition of OA as it is a lifelong condition that may affect participation. OA may be associated with cognitive changes, and these include attention span, memory, and problem solving, as when one has pain, especially chronic pain with like say OA, it can be very distracting. And so very much of the focus of one's person's thoughts, right? And as such, psychosocially, it can lead to depression, negative perceptions of body image, and even sexual dysfunction. So as an OT, you should provide and set clear expectations and goals, refer and provide resources for social financial support, and also to address depression and isolation with other psychosocial interventions you already learned in OT school. One myth is that the trigger of OA is often weather. Evidence really does not support the myth that weather conditions influence joint pain, but for unknown reasons, for some patients, the effect of weather on their pain seems to be real. So be client-centered and don't completely dismiss this trigger for patients if they think that's what's going on. Okay, let's review the OT interventions now for OA. First, let's go over contraindications and precautions as related to surgical interventions such as hip replacements. And these days, total knee replacements are quite routine procedures that do not involve as much rehabilitation, at least like in the hospital. In fact, I don't think I even remember the last time I worked with a patient who was a total knee in acute rehab, as they often get discharged quickly in like acute care, like just like that. So OT is even quite quick and simple for these patients in these sessions. But nonetheless, total knee precautions should be weight-bearing as tolerated, but also include not placing support, such as like a pillow under the knee while laying in bed. The patient should have support for their feet while in sitting so as to increase the range of motion due to knee flexion. Knee immobilizers may or may not be recommended based on the surgeon, and if not, really it's up to you. Personally, I am not a fan as I feel as these knee immobilizers are too compensatory when the patients probably aren't going to wear them in the long term, so they may benefit from using all the muscles and body systems and skills required for standing, weight-bearing, ambulation, and during activities. One general recommendation, though, is that patients should avoid stress on the knee joint, such as with squatting, kneeling, and especially with the twisting of the knee. Total knees are often abbreviated as TKR for total knee replacement, and THR is for total hip replacement. For total hips, remember that there are two approaches, posterior and anterior. Posterior hip precautions are no hip flexion greater than 90 degrees, no internal rotation, and no adduction. Anterior hip precautions are no hip extension, no external rotation, and also no adduction. Another precaution is to respect pain, especially symptoms that may be activity related. The saying, no pain, no gain, does not apply here. Besides precautions and respecting pain, there is also the concept of joint protection. Joint protection principles include avoiding staying in one position for too long, avoiding positions of deformity and forces in those particular directions that are just not good for the joint, and using instead the strongest joints that may be available, and ensuring good habits for correct patterns of movement. The best intervention as OTs you can do is occupation, as it inherently involves and addresses factors already, such as strength, range of motion, endurance, and other things, to name a few. Warming up may be a good idea, such as with PAMPs. You can use heat 
and ease them as they can help to reduce pain and also help to increase one's range of motion. Active range of motion is ideal, but passive range of motion can also be used as well. Isometric or isotonic strengthening exercises are okay if they are tolerable, as well as also doing low impact exercises such as aerobic exercises. But it's not all about exercise. If exercise is engaging and motivation for the patient, then yeah, by all means. But personally, I prefer prescribing engagement in meaningful and functional activities that the patient previously or is still or wants to be interested. For example, to address hand pain, maybe it is for during opening a jar often of like jam or a bottle or a medicine bottle. So instead, the patient can use an electric can opener or an automatic pet feeder or an automatic medication dispenser or an adapted one. Maybe it's for sewing or arts and crafts. It is then that you would use your activity analysis to determine the physics and mechanics involved, including the body systems and related to the environment, the patients, also their psychosocial and cognitive functions, and how you can use that all together holistically to work in their favor. So it is important to be client-centered and to ask these questions. But no matter the activity, pay attention to the type of contraction, such as isometric, eccentric, or concentric the duration of it, frequency, and protecting the joint. As mentioned, adaptive techniques can be used as well as environmental modifications to address symptoms in both conservative as well as with post-surgical OA patients. Another good adaptation are built-up handles, but also commercial options such as key holders, zipper poles, button hooks, sock aids, lever handles, and extended tools may be helpful. Even more higher tech devices, if financially feasible, options can be used, such as lighter weight and electronic appliances, including, say, electric toothbrushes, touch or voice-activated light switches and locks and thermostats, and so on, with like the smart home. You should address falls, such as modifications with, say, removing throw rugs, reducing clutter, cleaning up spills immediately, and also addressing lighting for the elderly or those with low vision. From a comprehensive top-down perspective, the OT can educate and address the disease process, address joint protection, pain and symptom management, as well as fatigue management and psychosocial management. For fatigue, you can use energy conservation techniques and the P's, which include planning, prioritizing, pacing, and positioning. But the extreme opposite should also be avoided, though. Avoid prolonged immobilization, as this can lead to joint stiffness, contractures, muscle atrophy, and compromise occupational performance in the long term. On the topic of splints, while patients may be recommended or even fabricated splints to support function, they should be encouraged to discontinue use as soon as possible, as soon as the condition improves or it is no longer indicated. So, in summary, osteoarthritis is a chronic and potentially debilitating condition that is not only physical, but can be psychological and psychosocial as well. The OT should provide education, a lot of education, should address pain, medication management, inflammation, maintain or improve range of motion, strength, and endurance, recommend relevant equipment such as adaptive equipment, DME, splints, encourage joint protection, and maximize one's performance and participation using work simplification, compensation, and energy conservation. Last, you should address the adjustment to disability with realistic expectations, but also hope for this condition. Support groups may be beneficial. So I hope this helps. Thanks for watching and give this video a thumbs up if you found it helpful and be sure to share it with your study groups. I'm Jeff the OT Dude and see you in the next one.